Kelsey Sheeran, TED Talk speaker, author, entrepreneur, coach, veteran. Un your life, radical accountability, purpose, and the truth about her Jocko Willink podcast. As featured on Jordan Peterson, Good Morning America, today's show, Cleared Hot Podcast, Jocko Podcast, and many, many more. Kelsey's passion and determination shine through in every word, making this episode a must listen. Whether you're looking for inspiration, practical advice, or just a great story, this conversation has something for everyone. We dived into the truth behind her Jocko Willink podcast journey and how it differed with her experience and insights with Andy Stumpf, adding another layer of depth to the conversation. I'm thrilled to share with you the latest episode featuring this incredible woman. This conversation is packed with insights, personal stories, and practical tips that you won't want to miss. So here's a sneak peek. Purpose and passion. Kelsey's journey from art therapy to founding Brass and Unity, a jewellery company that supports veterans and first responders. Mental health insights. Her personal battle with traumatic brain injury and PTSD and the importance of radical accountability. Sleep strategies. Practical tips for improving sleep, like using blue light glasses and adjusting meal times. Nature and movement. The benefits of spending time in nature and listening to your body. Self-exploration, finding your identity and purpose beyond your roles or professions. Moral injury and healing, overcoming challenges and trauma and the power of self-acceptance and forgiveness. Community and support, the significance of surrounding yourself with a supportive and accountable community. Psychedelic integration, how Kelsey's work with Heroic Hearts Project is helping others navigate their mental health journeys. Upcoming projects, exciting news about Kelsey's book being optioned for a movie and her various speaking engagements, and Brass and Unity, the story behind her unique jewellery made from bullet casings and their mission to give back. Tune in to the latest episode of Straight Talk Mind and Muscle podcast and join us on this journey of self-discovery, healing and empowerment. Stay strong and keep pushing forward. You can find Kelsey at in the show notes, all the links are below, just click on those, but her website is kelseysheeran.com. Her book in the show uh, notes below, kelseysheeran.com slash book, and on Insta, instagram.com, kelsey underscore Sheeran. Thanks for watching. I'm Damien Porter, former New Zealand Special Forces operator, subject matter expert from hownottodie.com.au, and you're listening to my Straight Talk Mind and Muscle podcast, Sponsored by these guys, mystate.com, the ultimate daily formula for optimum hormone health, stress management, energy, and performance. 100% natural and clinically proven ingredients, it provides everything you need to raise your game in a convenient, gut-friendly capsule. Links for my former shows are in the show notes below. Thanks for watching. And we're live. Welcome to the Straight Talk Mind and Muscle podcast. Welcome to my guest all the way from Canada, Kelsey Sharon. Hi, thanks for having me, dude. <laughs> Sorry about being here. <laughs> uh, it's always great to just chat beforehand and and uh, and have a, have a little um, informal talk here, our two countries. But more importantly, Kelsey, thank you for coming on. Um, you know, a long time coming. We connected originally through Dallas Alexander. Uh, which mm. was such an amazing guy, another Canadian. And um, uh, gosh, your story just blew me away. As soon as I heard your story, I tried to get you on. We had some um, connection issues and, and here we are. I see now you've you've uh, been on a few shows that some of the other guests have um, been on. Um, I, I saw uh, Andy Stump uh, interviewing you the other day. That was great on the Cleared Hot podcast. Yeah, Andy's a good friend. I've done his show a couple of times now. I was very very lucky and very honored to get uh, introduced to him a few years ago and when I asked him if he would put a review in my book he so graciously did and I couldn't think of a there's a few Navy SEALs in there but he was definitely one of the ones I wanted to uh to wanted to get to know and be friends with so um yeah I was really grateful for that uh, opportunity and uh, I'm looking forward to you know doing more and just kind of being around the people I enjoy he's such a um a real guy i met him um over here uh when the seals came over and did the triple seven jump finished in perth um a good friend of mine and, and, i don't know if you know kirk parsley dr kirk parsley yet no i had to think about that for a second no i don't think i do 
I'll definitely connect you to um, okay. the, um you talked about sleep. I'm gonna dive into a few things. I'll make a note here to connect you. He was um Thank you. You're welcome. He, he was a um a SEAL uh pre to, pre nine eleven and went on okay. to become a doctor and, and back for their um as one of the SEALs doctors. But um yeah, I met, uh, met Andy, great guy, and, and had him on the show. Gosh, he's hard to keep up with. He's so fast and he's so self-deprecating as well, right? He's he's a riot. So I will say the reason I, I enjoy being friends with him, I mean, I'm not I'm not obviously his best friend by any means, but I'm, a, I'm an acquaintance enough, I think, to call him a friend. And he is somebody that I, when I sit down with, I have to be consciously aware to have my brain turned on and be very sharp because that man is not only self-deprecating to a, uh, to a fault, but he is so fast. He's so funny. And, um, he, he is, he gives me a run for my money. Most don't, but I love it because it, it's very much a feels like this, like brother, sister bicker. And he's just, he's just fire. So he's a good dude and he's a good representation of our community. And I'm, I'm, uh, stoked. Yeah. I'm stoked to get to hang out with him. He, he really is. Um, I, I, I never go into a show with um sort of preset questions. I go with a rough angle. And I was talking cool. to um Todd Bowler, a friend of mine. He's um he's been on the show, a world record holder actually, which is wild. Um, and I said I was interviewing you uh yesterday, and I thought, oh, yeah, so I better get an angle on this and figure it out. So a little bit of research, um, and the latest things come up with the shows, and I saw the Jocko Willink one, and I thought the difference between you know. And the way Andy comes across and, and, and then your experience with Jocko shows shows <laughs> Andy's uh, high points as well. And I'm not going to dive into it too much. I think it spoke for itself. Um, I <laughs> love I loved Andy's um, uh, show notes of your um, not, I, I guess, your combat story and so on. I love those. But what I really like. I've never read about- them. <laughs> and and you, and you, I'm not going to read them here. The listeners yeah. heard heard my show notes in a narrated intro, so they know where to find you. They know your background, which is cool. Because it's a bit weird when you're sort of hearing about yourself uh, in a conversation here. But what I love, Kelsey, was you open our conversation. Uh, you know, you don't want to talk about sharing war stories and so on. And my first thing I had here, I did have the right angle, is I want to talk about your purpose now. I would like to Thank find you. out from Kelsey what is your purpose. Yeah. I am so, I'm so grateful you asked me that. Thank you for that opportunity because it's something I'm actively making a consistent effort at. I had a show right before you, I was on um, another, another show and it was the same sort of thing. He's like, Hey, like, I know we've talked about the book and we've talked about your show and all these things, but like, who are you now? And I was like, yes, amazing. <laughs> what that illustrates to me is that you're consciously aware of people's ability to grow. And I love that. So thank you for that. So I guess I am, I'm, I'm just a, I'm a normal person who's trying to do my best. And what that looks like for me and what my purpose in life is to make sure that others feel hundred percent supported in what they do. And the reason I'm able to do that is because I am, I am a coach. I'm a psychedelic integration coach. Um, I'm a keynote speaker and I'm a breathwork practitioner. And within that, I also run a company. I'm the CEO of a company called Brass and Unity. And that was the first company I started in 2016. And I started it as a form of art therapy for myself. And it spun off into this company where we we make products like this one here. It's just our buddy check. And it has bullet casings integrated into some of the jewelry. And so we do that as a nod to my past. And the way that we use it is a vehicle to put the money in the hands of the charity that we work with and all the charities we work with. So I use uh, what the world gave me to then spur off into this new life of mine. So I'm a big believer in the saying, you know, the world, the world is happening for you and not to you. And so in taking that at face value, I really realized a long time ago, as much as I love running my companies and I love doing what I do, my podcast, my speaking, my coaching, it's where my heart lies because that's where you see people change. That's where you hold the container for humans to show up as themselves. And a lot of time, people just need the opportunity to be themselves in a different way, just like you showed up and gave me the opportunity. So thank you again. So I became a keynote speaker about a year and a half ago. I started speaking at universities and doing these amazing things. Uh, last year, I got to speak at Harvard with the veterans, um, the undergrad there, Huvo, which was such an, 
an incredible experience. And a friend of mine who I would love to connect you with, his name is Nick Gay. He's the flying Hawaiian and he is climbing seven summits right now. He's doing a ton for veteran organizations. He's a 75th Ranger. He's a bad dude. He's also quoted in my book and he's an individual who gave me this amazing opportunity because I told him one day I'd love to go there and he, and he goes to school there. So they had this event. They're like, Kelsey, do you want to speak? So after that, I got to speak. uh, I did a TEDx last year. That'll be published here soon. So I spoke about the 44 a day on behalf of the organization Honor House Society, which is one in Vancouver, which is actually the first organization I ever donated to. So I'm really near and dear to my heart when they asked me to do that. It was a big honor. And so I'm a I'm a speaker, I'm doing all these things, but really what it is is I'm a coach. I ultimately have walked this path every wrong way you could <laughs> post-service. <laughs> you know, so many of us do, right? Let's be honest, we all, You know, sometimes some people end up with strippers who say they love them and snorting coke off their assholes. And then sometimes you end (laughs) up with, you know, you end up with individuals who really do struggle with the loss of purpose and the loss of identity. And that can spur into divorce and just this really negative downturn. But I was so lucky to have the doctors I had um, who were able to allow me to look at the medication I was overprescribed and the way that I was going about my life and say, look, Kelsey, like we're going to give you some leeway. And because I, they, I had their trust, I was able to start diving into psychedelics. And once I did that, we were able to have this awareness. And I say, we, me, myself, my spirit, my soul, whatever you want to, whatever you connect with, whatever resonates with you. I was able to start showing up and healing her in a deep way. And psychedelics for me were this amazing tool and they're not the answer. They're the tool, right? They're a moment and a catalyst point that can help you get to where you need to be. And so because of that, I was able to then to really start to heal. I found out I had an undiagnosed traumatic brain injury, which was wild. So I started healing that about two years ago now. So since then, coupled with psychedelics, coupled with amazing integration and support networks, I've gotten to this really awesome point where I have this obligation and I believe most people do in life, whatever the profession or the, whatever you do during the day, because it's not who you are, it's just what you do. So whatever it is that you do during the day, I'm a big believer that if you've walked this path, you have an obligation to be the light for others and walk backwards now to show them how to get out. And so that's when I started coaching. I started coaching with uh, Heroic Hearts Project as a psychedelic integration coach. And I absolutely love that. But I also work privately. And so I have private clients where we work together to basically unfuck your life and to look at the gaps and the holes because we're all doing the best we can, but sometimes we just need perspective. And when you're able to give somebody that perspective, that's where you can really make the strides, the wins. You can really make the incremental changes that turn into huge habitual wins. And so I started coaching in January. I launched my website January and it's doing well and I'm loving it. And that's... That's just who I am now. Awesome. Gosh, there's a lot to unpack. I was furiously writing notes there. I apologize. <laughs> no, don't. It's it's great. That, and that's my job is to allow that person to share their story. Um, first off, uh, my life was changed by a, a Canadian um, back in my 20s, uh, a guy by the name of John Kehoe. And he um, he wrote a book and, and runs courses called Mind Power. And he said that same thing that you said, um, the world is working for you, not um, not at you. Uh, he talks about uh, the inner and outer worlds, but more importantly, that uh, you're the cause of everything that sort of happens to you and that the law of attraction and, and so on. So, so true. It's a perspective, but also it's a creation and, and you're clearly creating that. Um, you talked about a, a bunch of different things just for the listeners and the viewers. You said 44 a day, you know, you're talking about uh, a, a combat veteran speaking to veteran suicide, veteran mental health mm-hmm. and, and so on. Um, when you spoke about the psychedelics, um, another uh, guest uh, on the show, he spoke to that originally. Um, he's the heathen machine on on Instagram. Uh, and he just said uh, taking uh, psilocybin one one time, it just allowed him to to experience gratitude, this amazing sense of gratitude, and it was life-changing for him. Um, I'm going to come back to that. I'm, I'm going to form the question. 
you you said you're over over prescribed medication chris van mm -hmm. santa another guest uh, on the show delta guy he was the same and and had a lot to pull out from there uh, and then tbi gosh um and i know your your husband went through a, a, a tbi problem as well um mm -hmm. yeah look there, there's it's almost chicken the egg um with tbi um and mental health they're so interrelated but um, mm -hmm. yeah, Joe Dottori, I'll connect you with him, Professor Joe Dottori and Commander Joe Dottori, he actually invented a cure for TBI, seven different modalities um, because of his own TBI. He, um, he works for acute and, and chronic TBIs. My question from all that, you've been through a lot. Um, and what's so great about someone who's been in the trenches and then goes to help people what would you say are the lowest hanging fruit, the big the big winners there for starting to make progress and overcoming and digging yourself out of that that hole? Amazing. God, I love that. So yes, to back up, my husband had a TBI and that's the only reason we started looking into, okay, maybe that's why I'm not getting better. And as you said, they do overlap. Mm. So PTSD and TBI show 11 of the same 13 characteristics. Wow. That's an easy way to miss that, right? Um, and that's what's been happening is we've been putting the cart before the horse in a lot of treatments, and that's yeah. kind of where we're at. So the Canadian government, I am Canadian. Um, this is something that I testified to at the Senate subcommittee during the emerging treatments with psychedelics, which was it's an acknowledged failure that SSRIs are a treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder within veterans and combat veterans and first responders. So we know that, right? So if we understand that we are doing the wrong things, then we should stop doing the thing. So antidepressants now, have been shown not yeah. to work for depression. Yeah. So, well, we know that, right? We understand that. I do believe, and there's a bunch of stats on this and I can, I'll, I'm happy to send them to you afterwards, but I think it's like over 2%, uh, two, over two times more effective is physical fitness than it is as an antidepressant. So you're telling me that we could go for walks for 30 minutes a day at a brisk pace and do that for 12 weeks. And we would see such a significant improvement that SSRIs are not useful. Then that should be enough for them to not be used for that modality, period, full stop, nothing more than that. But money comes but into also, it, so there's an issue there, so that's not going to happen. Yes. Right, so you've got that. You've got the money issue, which is always going to have capitalism. You've got the laziness factor and the victim mentality. So what I suggest is if you want to take charge of your life, you want to take responsibility and accountability for your life, the first thing you start doing is looking at your life. And the way that you do that is you sit down with a piece of paper, and number one, I always challenge people, do you know who you are? Most people don't. So how you start by doing that is to sit down and go, I, I heard I heard a speaker say this actually at an event I just did um, in Montana with Not Dead Yet Retreat. Um, who, what, what was his name? Keaton. He goes by The Muscle on Instagram. And it was very simple. And he gave this journaling tactic. And he goes, look, who would you kill for? Who would you die for? Once you know who you'd kill for and who you'd die for, you can then look at, okay, well, if it's my family and it's this and it's that, then you look at, okay, what about my family? right? What about, what is that? What does that mean? What does my integrity stand with that? Okay. So I know we'll never cross that line. I'd kill for that or I'd die for that. Perfect. So then you know that your family matters. The whole point of these exercises is if you don't know who you are, how do you know where you're going? So it's about looking at what makes you tick, what makes you happy, what makes, what makes you work. And I know that can seem intimidating, but it's as simple as when I wake up in the day, I do this, 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 and this. Okay, if you do then look at your habits and your behaviors and you're honest with yourself, you go, okay, well, there's a gap here that maybe instead of saying I couldn't work out, I could. Or maybe I see over here, I go to bed a little late. Well, maybe that's because I'm scrolling on my phone too much. So the number one thing that I was always taught very early on, which is like the easiest and the lowest hanging fruit is your sleep. Wow. If you're not sleeping, then you're not going to, your brain isn't going to function or work for you. And if you're not sleeping, then your mood changes. And if your mood changes, then you choose shittier food. Then you choose shittier food. Then you watch shittier things. Then it just is the cyclical pattern. Now, can I so, pause that? Absolutely. Because that, that, that uh, was the center of, of my angle here. And that's what Dr. Kirk Parsley works on the most. But um, I put that in there, Kelsey, after watching a little bit of you and Jocko yesterday and you are literally the most forthright woman I've... No, that's the wrong word. Straight, straight up. <laughs> Aggressive. Um, <laughs> straight up blunt woman I've ever um, ever come across, which is amazing. Um, and Thank you. And what jumped out at me was, you know, trying to sleep. Uh, the, the moral injury that was um, uh, incurred upon you by Jocko was, was his actions. 
you know, how bad is it? And this is a rhetorical question. When sleep is scary, because lying yeah. in that bed for that time, when people are in that hole, and people that are in that hole now and listening, they can understand that. People that um uh, are not in that hole, it, it seems not a big thing. But when you're laying in bed, um, my gosh, it's mm -hmm. just it's so scary when you wake up at two in the morning and those thoughts are occurring over and over. Oh, the it's sleep, the worst. Hormonally, physiology is super important. So what um what tactics techniques do you use? to work on that sleep because yeah you said all those things and that's nice and it's also a hundred percent correct all those things you said right how do you how did you work on on getting that sleep yeah. um fixed this is where that radical accountability comes in yeah. i'm not saying extreme ownership that's not what i'm saying i'm saying <laughs> radical accountability i'm not saying that for sure of it <laughs> like, i'm saying radical accountability yeah. radical accountability for all of the actions things you do in your life so here's yes. how you do it okay you can go on Amazon. This is amazing. Type in blue light glasses, not clear lenses, orange lenses. They cost about $30. Get them to your door. You'll get them by the time we're done this conversation. Grab those guys at 6 p.m. You put those on because the first thing we're going to start doing is we're going to start shifting your circadian rhythm. And the way we do it is super easy. You wear funny looking glasses. Trust me, there's cute ones now. You'll be fine. So pop those babies on. Cool. Now what's next? Well, eating a little bit earlier is always going to help and give your body that rest and digest before you go to sleep. So your body's not in there trying to digest it all. So look at your eat your schedule time for dinner. Really important. Okay, cool. Now what? Well, how much caffeine have you had? So we know how long the shelf, the shelf life is for caffeine. I'm not a doctor. I don't need to break that down for you. It's pretty simple. When you drink coffee before bed, most people, it doesn't affect I mean, so most people it affects some, it doesn't, which I don't really fully believe that because your nervous system is still heightened, which means you're not getting that deep run. So this goes back to blue light glasses, eat early, don't eat a bunch of bullshit, drink your water early, and then you go to bed at a manageable time. Now, the reason I say go to bed at a manageable time is because we understand that our brains and our bodies rest and they heal when we sleep. So going to bed at a manageable time while wearing your blue light glasses. Now let's get into the uncomfortable conversation. Screen time. Mm -hmm. People are addicted to their phones and their TVs and that's okay. Nobody's, nobody's, I'm not faulting you for it. I'm, I'm guilty of it. <laughs> We're talking over a screen right now for God's sakes. I think they have a, a, a really great uh, place in our lives, but we've allowed them into our bedrooms as well, which has then become a sleep issue. And we wonder why we're all irritable. So here's what we do. You take that phone and it's say if you work at night, I get it. You work, it's hard. But you take that phone and when you sleep, it's in a different room. Number one, get an alarm clock. You do not need, I need it for my alarm. No, make an excuse, cut it out. Get an alarm clock. Put that thing in another room. <laughs> excuse me. After that, if you're going to watch TV before bed, whatever. I'm not going to say anything to anybody because I, both my husband and I sit on either side of the bed and stretch and we watch The Office for 30 minutes before bed. And only The Office. Do you know why? Because it's funny and it's lighthearted and we and, move on. And that's a routine. You've set up your sleep routine. Yep, exactly. It's called sleep hygiene for these reasons. So phones in another room, blue light glasses are on. Everything's pitch black in our room when we sleep. And then we go to bed at nine o'clock every night. We go to bed at the same time and we wake up at the same time. It gives the body the opportunity. Now, once you've got sleep dialed, <coughs> which you're like, well, but Kelsey... It's really loud where I live. Get a noise machine. I have a noise machine, just like my seven-year-old son has a noise machine, <laughs> and they play nature sounds because we understand that certain sounds and certain vibrations, they give people what they need. And so for us, we, we listen to rain, if it's raining, or the nature sounds. Then we go to bed, pitch black. We wake up in the morning. What's the first thing we do? We don't grab our phone. We wake up and we say our gratitude. You can call it prayer. You can call it whatever you want, but we say our gratitude because what do we understand about gratitude? Anxiety and gratitude live in the same spot. So you cannot have one when the other's existing. So have gratitude instead. So when I'm getting anxious, I go, okay, I feel it. I don't love it. You know what? It's okay. I'm really grateful today because I'm alive to feel it. I'm really grateful today because I'm breathing. And I just start saying all these things I'm grateful for. And next thing you know, I calm back down. So I wake up, uh, depending on the day, my husband is much better at this than I've been sick for the past three weeks. So I've been sleeping till like 7am, which is just ridiculous. And I need to get back out of that. 
Um, <clears throat> but now I'm getting better. And so now we go back to six and we get up at six and we do some form of movement. And if you have cold water, even if it's a shower, then we hit we hit at least a minute under cold water in some way, shape or form. There's no excuse and I'll tell you why. I don't have a $15,000 cold plunge. I don't have something from plunge. I don't have something from Blue Cube. I don't have something from all of these. I have a Tupperware from Canadian Tire, which is like a home hardware or a Lowe's or a Walmart. And I fill it up and I stick that thing in the backyard. There's no excuse. So we do that. We get the movement. We feed ourselves with high fats and protein because that's what our big old brains need to function. And then we get my son ready for school and we take him to school and then we start our day. And we have one coffee and all caffeine stops at 11 a.m. Awesome. Not hard, awesome. guys. It's just discipline. And basic knowledge, it, it really is. Um, you're so right. Um, you, we speak the same language. Uh, I teach the, those exact steps with um, with clients, with the, the the sleep side of things. But what I do teach them, your analogies are great. Um, I give an analogy of because uh, when you spoke about your seven year old son mm -hmm. and the and the, the noise um, uh, machine, so the baby's biology for sleep is the same as us. We are the same biology and you don't do bath, bottle, soothe, and then put Rambo on the TV with all the lights yeah. on. <laughs> <laughs> you know? That clearly so doesn't great. make sense. Even for those uh, non-parents out there, you do the same thing for yourself and and you right. did that so well. Um, Lizzie Dobson, a uh, criminal psychologist and clinical psychologist the other day, she talked about the difference between males and females, what they want to watch on TV at night. And the, yeah. the female typically, and I, your brain's kind of like ours more, more so, the female's like uh, married at first sight and all the, um, all the uh, yeah, exactly, the yucky ones. <laughs> and the males, actually like, the males actually like something different and it allows them both to wind down psychologically. It's, it's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting too, because I'll do, I'll travel and I'll come home and like we go to bed at nine o'clock. But if I... My husband knows it's going to be a late flight and I'm going to be home at nine. He's like, he'll stay awake and let me watch the office for 15 minutes. Cause it's yep. literally where I think we're on like the 49th round of rewatching <laughs> the series just because it's lighthearted. It's funny. It's back when things could be somewhat offensive and no one got canceled. It was a good, there's just a lightheartedness and it doesn't help that John Krasinski is ridiculously gorgeous. So we can all live with that. <laughs> My point is it's about just honoring what, what we need and what our bodies need. But most of us don't know what we need because we're not listening. We're so inundated with data and information and like data from notifications and like all of these things that we have lost touch with what it means to be in these meat sacks walking around. You know, I'm a big proponent of grounding and uh, forest bathing. I think that and for those who are like, you mean walking in the woods? Yeah, I mean that. I mean walking in the woods. <laughs> but I'm a coach now, so we try to act accordingly, okay? So walking in the woods, getting that fresh oxygen, really being in nature and with no sound. Going for walks, challenging yourself to work out without sound. Not giving yourself input, but listening to your body talk. So much of us really respond based on up in our minds because we're logical thinkers or whatever, we've lost touch. But I challenge people to bring it back down to the breath and to stay connected because every decision you make from your heart and your intuition is always going to be right. But I don't trust my thoughts because they've attacked me before. So I trust my body more than I trust my thoughts. My heart is my driver. And I know there's some people that's ridiculous, but it is. My heart is my driver. If it makes me feel good in here, then I know it's the right decision ultimately. But I cannot trust all the time that my brain isn't trying to sabotage me and say, well, you should just respond. Well, how do I feel about that? Let's check in for a sec. Oh, maybe I think else, maybe we take a sec. Okay, maybe we take a sec then. So Gosh, I've just changed up the way I do things. Yeah, that's really interesting how you said that. Um, Jess Wilson, uh, another um, guest on the show, she talks about um, if it's not a resounding yes, it's a no. And that resounding, that's an interesting word um, or adjective or whatever the fancy people call it. But you're talking about from your heart, she's talking about something different. And I think that would be an indicator of that, right? Yeah. So uh, if you look on my Instagram page, my pinned post, if it's not a fuck yes, it's a hard no, full stop, nothing else. Wow. And yeah, it's it's been up there for a while. It's, uh, I believe in that fully because I used to do things or make decisions based off FOMO. Do I need to be there? Should I have to be there? Should I need to be in the room? And then I started to realize that you'll be in every room that you put yourself forward with, but you'll know which ones to push or to not push. Meaning 
I used to go to all of them, but that was because I was letting my mind lead me. And yeah. then once I started to listen to my heart and my intuition, and so your intuition is really what it knows because we're humans going through a human experience and we come from the planes and we understand that's why when somebody is ousted or canceled, they have a meltdown and they have a meltdown because we are humans with the genetic component that understands that when we are not in a tribe, we die. When you're ostracized from the group, you will die. Yep. And this, so your whole body goes into that. So it's not like, oh, you were just like canceled. It's like, no, the human biology dictates that that didn't just feel like that. It felt like that I was literally being killed off. And so that makes it so much more intense when you break it down to what it means to be human. So you can always trust your gut because that is the part of us that has been the well-tuned machine for tens of thousands of years. Wow. So you have to. I'm going to come back to the moral injury and the mm. ostracization of the tribe there, but I want to cover off the, the nature and sleep side of that. Um, you said thousands of years there. Uh, you talked about forest breathing and someone should Google that that's listening because that's a thing from Jap Japanese studies. Um, when I talked to some people with uh, in regards to sleep, there's a study where they took about 20 extreme insomniacs uh, into the woods. So his, and the American said woods over here, it's the bush or whatever you want to call it. But it was America. And they took a, these people, some of them hadn't slept um, probably for 20 years. They turned to the, into, the, into the woods for 14 days. And after 11 days, every one of them, so some normalized uh, on day three, four, after 11 days, every one of them, 100% had normalized their sleep. I'm saying that because you're talking uh, lack of uh, blue light, uh, you're talking grounding, you're talking nature. It's it's just simple biology. And they were only um, 11 days away from actually being a normal human, if you consider that. And they had 20 horrible years of their life. Uh, nature doesn't lie, as as was the title of an, another show. And uh, in this city world we've got going on, Kelsey, the orange glasses, um, the, the sleep within two and a half hours of, of sunset, um, the uh, the noise uh, machine, the grounding, you're just replicating what nature has, right? Well, we keep acting like we don't understand why our population is sick and unhealthy. We keep acting like we don't have the answer, so we have to create the solutions. When the solutions to the problem have existed forever, we've stopped listening. This is not a complicated subject. You don't have to be Andrew Huberman to break this shit down. It is very simple. Humans going through a human experience pulled out of their environment and their natural environment will inevitably become sick. Why is that rocket science? When we lived close to the earth, we are the most successful. Why is it that the Mennonites and the Amish didn't have any issues during the C word? Yeah. When you take people or any animal, anything, anything, look at the whales when we put them in captivity, look at the animals when we put them in zoos, look at what happens when you take the thing out of its environment and then you drop it into a dirty thing and we go, it's going to be fine. That's called delusion. And that's where we're at. And then we tell the people around the thing, no, they just need outside chemicals to fix the thing. No, we need to look back at what works for a human to thrive and we need to start replicating it. Why is it in Canada and the United States when you compare photo by photo, because I've done this several times, to a prison, to a school, they're identical. Why is it that people in prisons get more yard time than our children? Why is it that the food is so bad that America, I'm in Canada, so here we go, why America's obesity rate is what it is. We don't have to act like this. We are creating the problems because if you create the problems, then people will pay for the solution. The thing is, and the dirty joke is you've had the answer all along. You just need to look in the mirror. And as my friend says, when you get the answers, hang up the fucking phone. <laughs> oh wow um 
You're so right about uh, from the natural environment. You spoke about um, animals and so on, but let's bring it back to humans. Uh, mm. I had a lecture that I did for years on nutrition, and um, one of the things I put up there is a photo of um, of Fijians and the mm. native Fijians. Uh, it's a beautiful photo. There's three or four of them, female and male, uh, chiefs, chiefs in print. Oh, I'm not sure the word, the correct term for Fijian, but maybe a Fijian princess, and they were in shape. And this was from uh, like the 1800s, uh, 1850s, I think, uh, whenever the camera was invented. And then I said, okay, let's have a look at the top chief. So he was the head of the army then, and also the um, the defense minister of Fiji. And they're big and fat. And hang on a sec, that's literally over 100 years. And the studies show that when you take a, um, mainly around the Pacific region, um, the people that live in the, in the um, the tribes and take them into the city and they eat city food, it changes dr drastically. So that's a photo that I'm thinking I'm going to put in, into this show. Um, you said movement something. Movement is oh. medicine. Yeah. What was that? Sorry. Movement is medicine. You. I'm gonna. I'm gonna go over that with you as well. You also said something there about can, um, the tribe and um, ostracization. You spoke, you said purpose on an identity earlier. There's a mm -hmm. three-legged stool, and correct me if I'm wrong, or we can uh, dive into it more. I think that losing purpose, identity, connection is a three-legged stool. Is that, that's the perfect storm. You lose those three and you're gone. Um, it's interesting that most veterans and, and people, even sports people that I've interviewed, losing their purpose and identity is terrible but that losing their connection when they leave the team when they lose the they leave the military or they leave the place whatever that's also super bad that's where i found uh, a lot of help for me and a lot of the the people i interview they're keeping that connection but i'm thinking about this from a different um angle now because you talked about the um the the disconnection we had you said the c word you've said other words <laughs> probably just as, as bad on the show um that really disconnected us. And I never thought about con disconnection, ostracization from the cancel culture and from the um, uh, the injections and the crazy things we had to have and, and masks. That's losing connection. Yeah, it's designed. It's designed to cause uh, formality, like a, a, a way of doing things. It's, it's, it's a way to make everyone the same. And when you're able to do that, then that's how you can uh, dehumanize, right? And then when you dehumanize, then you can manipulate. And when you can manipulate, you can make anybody do anything. Look well, we can dehumanize and kill that. So <clears throat> in interviewing Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman, who Andy Stumpf and I <laughs> have realized- I've had him quickly. on. You've had Dave Grossman on? Yeah, he was like one of my first guests. Oh, wow. Yeah, he was a guest about a year or so ago. And when Andy's show comes out, you're going to have some real truth bombs there. But one thing he did say that was was factual was, uh, you know, it's very hard to hurt a human front on, uh, yeah. very hard to kill a human front on. But when they turn around and run away like they did in the Civil War and so on, they're not human anymore. So it's no problem. So same mm -hmm. thing there, the masks, the dehumanization you're talking yeah. about. Gosh, um, what an interesting uh, angle you've got there. And we need to get that connection back and get that 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 tribe looking after each other back. Yeah. So when you look at it's it's really like that three pillar is absolutely accurate. Your community is so important. When you lose your loss of identity and purpose, it's a massive blow. So I've had that happen a couple of times in my life. When I was a uh high level fighter. When I, I fought from the age of four to 14, and then I fought for 18, 19, and 20, and then I stopped. In, so what, the in what sort of sport? Uh, international Taekwondo fighter. Oh, I was wow. in the WTF. Yeah. yeah. So I was national champion by 12, and then um, I stopped fighting in my teenage years because my coach went to prison for sexually assaulting my teammate. Oh, my and so God. Yeah, it was a wild journey. And the reason it was, and so when you talk about athletes losing their purpose, I went through that at a young age because it wasn't a sport I did. It was who I was at the time. I was two a days. I was training national team. It was an important thing for me. And when that happened, it happened at a really formidable years of my life. I was you know, 13, 14. That was like, whoa, time. Yeah. And um, I went through this massive transition where I had a loss of identity. I became very angry individual. Um, you know, high school was rough for that for because of that. Obviously, looking back, I can understand what it was that was going on. 
I didn't understand then. And so I, I used, I dove into sports and I dove into alcohol and I dove into behaviors in a small town that all small, small towns have. And, um, I became a, you know, I played rugby for, for six years. We traveled multiple countries. I, I wow. love it. I think it's amazing. I was a national motocross racer for a long time. You know, I did all of these different sports trying to find myself again, because I was an athlete and my goal of that athlete was Pan Ams and Olympics. And that's what my path was until it was ripped. So when that happens, you can, one of two things can happen. You can, you know, realize it's not your identity and, and you go move on, or you can have the opposite, which is like the anger and the hate and the frustration and the, you know, the, just the, the self deprecating life that you end up living. And then I joined the military. So, you know, it was a great time. So within that though, after service, because of my injury in Afghanistan, because of all of those things, I lost my identity again. And yeah. again, by not by choice. So lost my, my, uh, lost my career path with Taekwondo due to somebody else's actions lost that due to the military saying I had to be medically discharged. And so at what point do I decide to start taking radical accountability for my life and start saying, I'm no longer going to allow others to control what my path looks like, my purpose, my community, and ultimately what I'm here to do on the face of this earth. So when you take away community and you take away your purpose and you take away that innate drive, what are you left with? You're left with a person who doesn't know the directions to go because they don't know who they are anymore. And we're not teaching people how to look inward and do the self-exploration that is necessary and needed to then find purpose, to then find community, to then find support. And so because of that, you have these 44 a day. Because of that, you have people feeling ostracized and left out. And then you get the victim mentality, woe is me, must be nice. And that's just not what we need more of. We need the complete opposite. So when you give people the tools or you catch people before they're transitioning out of a sport as an athlete, out of the military as a service member or first responders, if you can teach them early enough that it's not their identity and it's not their purpose, it's just something they do. And then you help them find their purpose by finding and doing and talking to them about what sets their soul on fire when they wake up in the morning. Because anything, you can do anything as a job anymore. It's not the same like it used to be. So it's like, well, yeah, but Kelsey, some of us need to make money. Well. I do too, but the way I do it, I don't do it in everything I hate. I do it in the stuff I love because when you're doing things from love and you're doing things from your heart, you're going to do them 10 times better, 10 times harder, and you can make a career out of all of those things. But we just have to show people that they can do that, that their jobs aren't who they are. It's just what they do. Yeah, I, I agree. The other part of that, I've had people reach out to me. I'm sure you have them all the time as well, and you do you do with clients. Um, I've had people specifically say, look, I'm not sure. I don't know what my purpose is. I don't know how to... This probably came about, I'm trying to recall the exact message like, like you tend to do. Um, how did you find out that you wanted to do How Not to Die Guy? Or how did you find out you wanted to do the podcasts? Um, it looks like an overnight thing, right? Like, um, like Pat McNamara, basic dude stuff. That 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 didn't happen overnight. You know, that dude was going to drink himself into death. Literally, his, he stated that uh, online. Um, so they asked me, how did you find that? And um, and I gave them my sort of answers. But what's your suggestion? At how they do find their new identity? And I am very clear that I was born to be a special forces operator. Uh, you know, that was what I was great at, but I'm also born right. to help others um, uh, with different things. But there is an identity there for, for SF. Um, and I had to then find a new identity, but is very, that transitional space is difficult. So what's your suggestion to these people that are so unsure? What's the sort of path that you uh, have ideas on? Take a look in the mirror and realize your identity is who's standing right in front of you. Wow. That is good. Okay. So taking a look in the mirror, which most people can't do yeah. because they do struggle with this is something I see looking yourself dead in the eyes and saying, hi, my name is see how that feels. Cause I'll bet you most of the time people are used to saying, hi, my name is da, 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 da. Those are just things you do. It's not who you are. So once you sit there and you're able to look at yourself and say, hi, my name is, then you can start sitting down and going, who am I? Once we know who we are, we know what we love. Once we know what we love, 
we can look at how can I make one of those a job? How can I expand on that? Well, I love helping people. So what does that look like? Well, I like helping people walk through what I walked through because I knew how terrifying it was walking alone. Okay, well, maybe I want to go into support. Maybe I want to go into things like that because now you're not just doing it for money, but you're doing it because you know you are showing up for someone else. So it's about exploring what you enjoy doing. And I know that sounds cliche and you don't, well, yeah, but Kelsey, I went to school and I did eight years of this and I maybe I don't want to be a doctor anymore. Okay, and then don't be a doctor anymore. You know, there's really great opportunities for you to go work anywhere in the world in the United Nations and the Red Cross. Do you know that there's other opportunities that you could do if you are somebody who has gone to school for something? And I guarantee there's other nonprofits or there's other people that, if you truly want to change what you're doing, there are opportunities. So you can't direct anyone to go do anything unless they know who they are and what they want in their life. And you don't have to know maybe at that second if you want a certain lifestyle or X, Y, and Z. Maybe it's just, hey, I want to feel good for a year. Yeah. So maybe instead of focusing on everyone else around me for this year, I'm going to look at what does Kelsey need? And I'm going to give her exactly what I would give a client that I've negated to give her at this point and do the work yourself for a minute. Because if you don't know who you are, how the hell are you supposed to know what you need? You're bringing such a female um, take angle on this whole thing. And I've interviewed the Straight Talk Mind and Muscle podcast isn't about veterans. It's uh, th There's a lot of high-end performers there. They're great, but it's not about veterans. But there's been a lot of veterans on. And a lot of them are male that have been through this. You know, Tom, you know them all. Tom Siddeley, Chris Vincent, um, whole bunch of, of people. Ollie Ollerton uh, is, a, is a, a British one as well. And obviously Dallas. But the difference, I've, I've heard it a few times in your Kelsey. What does Kelsey need? And it's such an interesting take, especially with you, because... This is not an insult. This is a, definitely a okay. compliment. You're, you're action orientated. You're, or people would call it male brain orientated because as Jordan Peterson so rightly says, uh, two ways to deal with an issue. Females talk about every nuance under the sun, no action. Males go action and no no talking and you actually need both. You're kind of literally that. Um, what does Kelsey need? And it's really refreshing and really uh, eye-opening. You have said the same thing. The reason I'm getting to this is the All Blacks rugby coach I interviewed um, a couple of weeks ago, Steve Hansen. Um, I think the advice he gave to his younger self was self-love. Love yourself a bit self more. And this is a, a manly man. Um, self-love. And gosh, you, you're so right. You, you mentioned something there about go away and love yourself for a year or be kind to yourself and so on. I actually know a guy who um, was a, a law degree and accounting degree so double degree and um he worked in an accountant's office for one year and uh and he left to become a postman he loved walking around and, and being outside so it mm -hmm. is not kelsey talking about um an ethereal idea you can physically do it and he was so happy but it's really interesting your, your take on things there uh about looking inwards and that self-reflection is is it's missing so much. Well, I think, uh, number one, the All Blacks are my favorite team ever. And I got to, I haven't seen them play in person. That is a dream. But I I did get an experience that I never thought I would get. And, I, and to this day, it gives me goosebumps everywhere in my body. I had an opportunity for someone after a ceremony as a way of saying thank you to the group that was with him. Because he went through a really rough experience. He did the haka for us. Oh, no way. Yeah. In Peru <laughs> on an ayahuasca retreat. Wow. And I got to tell you, um, and then afterward, we did the hug with the foreheads and the breath. And it anyway, it was just a wild, uh, very beautiful experience. And every time I watch the All Blacks play, I, I get excited because it's like the what I love so much about rugby and what I love so much about them is they fucking love who they are to their goddamn core and they are so passionate about it so my dream is to watch them play sidebar <laughs> sorry um now number two you know the thing is about self-love and self-worth they're directly tied so how do you expect anybody else to give you what you want 
or get you to where you want to be in this world if you don't believe you're even worth having those things. Yeah. Beautiful. You're limiting yourself if you don't love yourself. And it's fucking hard, man. The problem is in our world right now, there are a million self-help books and a million self-help people. And I'm, I know as I'm saying it, I am a coach. I'm consciously aware. But the difference is there's all of these things. It's a very simple analogy, but we struggle with this so much. When you get the answer, hang up the fucking phone, implement the job, do the task. The problem is, is we're not doing the self-work that we're reading and absorbing. We're constantly looking for more answers because if you're constantly looking for the answers, you never have to implement the things that you've learned. And what you've learned are things that are hard to face. What you've learned is that there is so much more work to be done on yourself. But once you realize it and you've now brought it to the conscious awareness, you're obligated to fix it. And some of that's really scary. And some of that's really heavy. And some of that's really hard. And maybe you weren't ready to hear what you had to hear. But now it's at the awareness. So you don't have a choice. So people constantly absorb more self-help, more self-help, more self-help. Oh, I'm learning. No, I'm learning. I'm learning. <laughs> well, if you're learning and you're never putting it into practice, it's like psychedelics. If you're not doing the integration before and you're not doing it with intention and you're not doing the integration after, you're just on a trip. Yeah, exactly. Then it comes back to the radical accountability. Your quotes mm -hmm. are really interesting. They're, they're like anchors and almost like uh, exclamation points to um, to your um, uh, titles or headlines, as you were. Um, you know that one you say when you get the answer, just just hang up the fucking phone. <laughs> um, that is not mine. It is a good friend, I, I, somebody I just became good friends with, and. Uh, it stuck with me so much and I've used it now like three times this week already because it is so honestly and brutally true. This yeah. is the self-help industry. If you've got the answer, which most of us do, hang up the fucking phone because now you need to go inward because yeah. all the answers are in here. Everything around you that you react to is just a mirror for you. It's triggering something in you. So when I have somebody who's talking with me and they say I'm intimidating or I'm aggressive or I'm X, Y, and Z, I'm not aggressive. I'm not intimidating. I rattle something in you. And in the same person who said that quote to me taught me this. There's the purple dinosaur test, right? It's how you differentiate if it's your feeling or somebody else's feeling. Meaning sure. if you go on my Instagram, you're going to see a video of me being verbally assaulted on the beach by my house. But you can tell that had nothing to do with me. That person was just looking for someone to take it out on. Was it the uh, the about... tall guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So something something about me yep. triggered that individual. Yep. So my response to those things is, I'm not getting any dimmer. Put some fucking sunglasses on. Go fix your shit. Cause that is nothing to do with me. My your belief or your opinion of me is none of my business. I use that. I use the same yeah. thing. What other people think of you is, is none of your business. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it is. I'm glad you brought that one up. I was I was going to touch on that, but you've explained it well. And again, so succinctly um, as well. I'm going to, I've got sort of two things to cover off on. We, the, All right. Let's maybe look at, we'll finish on the book and lectures. Cool. And the next thing I'd like to talk to you about, um, you've already said why. I was going to ask you how you're in such great shape. And I have never asked someone that on the show. But no, it's all I, cool. I thought to myself, hang on a sec, veteran, um, PTSD, a bunch of stuff, and you're in great shape. But you said your sports background as well. Mm -hmm. The reason I was going to ask about that um, was I watched, uh, there's a, I don't know his name. I haven't followed his podcast. He looks kind of wise, but he was on Pierce Morgan the other day. Pierce Morgan asked him the question about um, what comes first, mental or physical uh, oh, health. Oh, Chris Williamson. Yes, that's him. Yes, thank you. Um, Modern wisdom. Yep. He he clearly stated and stuck to his guns, physical health. And that's what's got me to where I am. I'd like to get your take on it. Um, yep. Not only which comes first, because that was an interesting question, but um, what's more important for you, for Kelsey, mental or physical health? I think they're symbiotic and I think they have to be. And the reason is because 
I will never go back on an SSRI. Mm -hmm. I was on one for 10 years and it absolutely destroyed my gut health, my libido and my body's ability to make and produce serotonin. Yep. So in saying that, I believe if you don't have physical movement, your mental health is going to rapidly deteriorate. And we've seen that it's been proven. So this is a chicken and an egg situation. But I do agree that mental health is really, really, really important. I don't believe that they can co they, that they can exist separately. And I think that's what happened is over time in the you know the 1900s, we believe the mind and body were separate entities, and that's just why we got to the fuckery we got to. So, um, <laughs> I but I will say like it, it is a complicated one because I believe you need to have enough juice in the brain to get your body to move. I think that your body will only do what you tell it to do. And that comes from the mind. Um, I believe that the mind itself is a powerful tool. And if you can convince it to move the body, it'll move the body. Now, I've been so depressed that I couldn't take a step out of bed before. Yep. yep. To get my point. Yep. So I've literally thought myself so close to suicide so many times that the idea of getting out of bed was not happening which means because my mind had deteriorated so rapidly, I couldn't get myself to move. So because of that, it was an issue on my physical, which then turned into an issue on my mental yes. because they're all together. So when I was going through really, really bad bouts with my PTSD issues, I, if I could get myself to walk, then my mental would improve. So then yes. my physical had to take priority that day. But ultimately, my mind controlled everything. And so if my doctor and I could get me to a point where I could take a step out of bed, then we were cooking with gas. But if my mind shuts down fully, and maybe, and I don't know, I've uh, I've had somebody reach out to Chris before, and I, I believe he said I'm not a fit for the show. But what I will say is that if I do get an opportunity to talk to him about this, this is something I would challenge because... We understand that physical fitness is an incredible tool to healing the mind. There's no questioning that. But if you have someone that's so ill, that's so depressed, even if it's getting them from their bed to the bathroom, that's a win. But that's not enough to kick the bodies in. Yeah, you see where I'm going here. It's yeah. not enough to kick it for it to be a physical win to then turn it to the dopamine, to yep. then, you know, to get the runner high. So if you work on the mental health component, looking at the loss of purpose, looking at why the depression is happening, look at the chemical imbalances, look at the serotonin, look at the gut health first. If you can get the mind to a point where we can get it to move, then we have the opportunity to build the body, which will then build the mind. But if the chemical imbalance is so severe, if the gut health is so eroded and deteriorated, you're not going to convince that person to get up and do anything. You no. can drag them, but they're not going to go. So yeah. you do need to have in my, this is, Hey, this is only because I've literally attempted like suicide was my life for most of my twenties. I lived in that space. I lived in the, I want to die every minute and maybe, and I don't know him. Maybe he has never been to the depths but that's where I fucking live and that's where I thrive. And that's, I know, I know the darkness and I know the depths because I did a decade of it down there. So what I would say is if you have never been to the depths, to the truest sense, it's hard. It's hard to understand how the mind could literally stop you from eating and moving and breathing. Like it is so hard. I know most of the time we can muscle our way out of things. I know that too. But if the mind is that deteriorated and the gut health is that bad and there is the serotonin issue and the dopamine issue and an undiagnosed TBI, I can promise you, you are not going to get your body to go unless your mind wants you to go. That's it right there. Thank you. That was the summary. Thank you for being so open about what you spoke about. And I really yeah. want to acknowledge that. You have just said the exact thing that um, Major General Greg Martin said last week, and his show won't come out for a while, uh, bipolar general, mm. highest performing uh, soldier. Just and Even now, I'm absolutely lost for words trying to describe the show. It blew my fucking mind. And 
uh, he was he literally lost like 10, 20 kilos. He was he was a basket case. He was in the mental wards. He was he was um, every day the same thing you said. Uh, just couldn't move out of bed, um, which is interesting because it's a different mental illness, but great mm -hmm. show and amazing guy. And you said the same thing. I think that's a not a loaded question. I think that's a, a semantical question. Is that a word? <laughs> I think it's it a is question. today. <laughs> I love it. I support it. <laughs> Two veterans uh, being podcasters. Um, <laughs> I think it's 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 a moot point. Which one comes first? And yeah. and um, I think you you've actually got a better answer than was given by the by a journalist. And then whatever the other guy is, I'm sure he's pretty skilled. I said he seems pretty wise. But yeah, um, mental and physical health. I love that you spoke originally about sleep. That's the lowest hanging fruit, and you talked about movement as life, and that's where we got to with this question. Movement is mm -hmm. movement is um, is key. Medicine. Movement is medicine. Sorry, thank you. Um, the, I'd like to touch on something I, I slightly missed. We've talked about it a bit. You've um, inferred it, and that's the moral injury. Now, the reason I'm speaking about this is because it sounds like so eerie, fairy. Now, I've been through. Uh, all the teaching went through a, a very long course um, to help me out of the hole. And that moral injury seems to be that that last um, wrecking ball that, that breaks that damn wall, whatever analogies you want to have. But moral injury. Now, you li literally had those from, I think you said the age of 14 with the Taekwondo coach. He's sexually abused your um, mm -hmm. teammate, his, uh, his student, uh, and so on. Yeah, he uh, went to prison for statutory rape. Oh, my God. God, people, humans, mm -hmm. eh? The weakest link. Mm -hmm. um, but, and then I was trying to figure out how to address the Jocko thing. I, I, I literally. Um, Ooh, you're the first podcaster who's had the balls to do that. Let's go. <laughs> you addressed it so upfront. And I watched your whole thing until Jocko, in my opinion, dismissed it because I didn't hear an apology there, which mm -hmm. I was quite angry at. Now, two things, and I'll try and get this question right, because was I was watching Andy and then you, uh, sorry, Andy and then Jocko uh, together, and I was like, there's a big difference here. Um, mm -hmm. Moral injury, particularly when you put, and you said this, this is a paraphrasing, but it's, uh, you said you basically put him on a pedestal. You looked up to him is what you actually said. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Andy was different. It was, Andy was just on the same page. And I must, em uh, must emphasize I did not hear Jocko apologize. Moral injury. Uh, you had done all this work, because it's quite recent, um, and then the moral injury from that. How do you think, and maybe what is the best way to help overcome a moral injury? How's the best way to deal with that? So I'm going to take a second, because I can feel me going up into my mind, and I want to come back down. So just give me a sec here. I do that so I don't come off as a cunt. So let's try this properly. Okay. I appreciate that. That's a, a, I'm always learning on these things from people. Okay. So what you saw on the second episode of Jocko was me go straight to my mind. After two years of just being dismissed. So you saw a very hurt individual speak. So the moral injury that came from that, um, and it's not that I didn't put Andy on a pedestal. What I'm starting to learn is I put these men on pedestals when there's no reason for it. Not because their service isn't, they're not due that respect. That's not what I'm talking about. I mean, I had always looked for um, acceptance from men, starting with my coach. Right. My My coach was this like, his wife was a world champion. Like, just like, I just, I looked for approval from men. You were trained, that, were you were trained that way, Kelsey. Yes, 100%. So when I say that they don't deserve to be on pedestals as decorated Navy SEALs, I don't mean that. Special forces have a very place, special place in my heart because I've seen what they do. And I honor them and deserve, they deserve the pedestal and the service they get. So when I say the pedestal, what I'm saying is, I related more to Andy 
And the reason I related to Andy is because when all of this popped off, so for the listeners who aren't, you know, aware of this, I, I basically, a couple of years ago, I went on Jocko and um, we had an incredible conversation. I don't know if you caught the first, uh, the first episode, but I, I have been sent an audio recording from a fan and um, I do actually have it now. So I'm happy to send it to you if you want to listen to it. Awesome. It is five and a half hours <laughs> and it wow. was the most powerful episode I've ever given in my life. I think I cried and hyperventilated there so aggressively so many different times. I disassociated when my doctor watched it back. He was like, yeah, you disassociated. There was no way you're in your body. And he was right because afterwards when we went, we went out for dinner, my husband and I just down the street at this little Mexican spot, he has a photo of me and I'll send it to you after. I am hysterically crying and shaking from a cortisol spike. And as we're talking about it right now, I'm having a cortisol spike. Hey, just on that, Kelsey, how mm -hmm. crazy is it? I, I don't get to relate with many people there. How crazy is it when you see a photo of yourself and you know you were you were just not there? Yeah. Other people don't see yeah. it, right? No, they don't because they can't understand it. And that's okay. But no. it was very obvious. And my doctor watched it back. And the yeah, reason no. I had to go, who, doctor, who? Because my doctor's doctor is actually Dr. Passy as well. So that tripped me up at the beginning. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so... Essentially, I gave the interview and it was the hardest thing I'd ever done. My husband was in the room and it was a very intense interview. Um, it was the longest one he had ever recorded. I was one of the very few females on the show and it was before my book had come out. Mm -hmm. And what had happened is a very sick individual who is still not well that I served with in the British military for a very short period of time. He wrote a defamatory letter, which then ultimately ended in Jocko removing my episode without talking to me. Yeah, that's terrible. So it was. And so when you talk about loss of community, what had happened from that turned into this thing that affected my business and my reputation in the nonprofit space. And that to me is where now I'm losing my purpose. So we're losing yeah. community. Now we're losing purpose. And now we're questioning identity. And now we're questioning myself when yeah. i had my own photos and videos and written statements to prove i was doing everything i said i still felt like i was losing my mind i was questioning my own sanity sanity and people will say well that's pretty pathetic if you know that allowed someone to spin out but if you haven't been in the public eye and seen what that can do when it turns it can really be damaging so um after that if that was the only fallout i did lose um a bunch of speaking gigs i was you know, canceled from a bunch of universities and fire depart uh, police departments that were going to have me in for leadership. And so then that kind of made me sad because now it affects my business and affects my way to donate all the things, right? Then there was a fallout with another podcaster, which was just basically collateral damage yeah. um, due to lack of communication and situational awareness. It had, a, it had a repercussion with Lex Friedman. And that really yeah. upset me because I really enjoy that human and think he's, and I see, I speak very highly of him to this day, even though we've never spoke since. Um, even after this new Jocko episode out, I thought maybe, but it never happened. So I, and I can respect people's boundaries. That's okay. I, I fully get it. It was a really gross situation for everyone involved. Um, ultimately, Andy was the one who called me to let me know. And oh, so wow. I was doing a 50 kilometer run for charity. My buddy was training for something and he was like, do you want to run? I'm like, sure. And we're about halfway through and Andy called. And so Andy called and just, Hey, I got this letter. I don't know what you want to do here. Immediately. We got my lawyers involved. Immediately. We sent a cease and desist and everything got backtracked, but the damage was done. So I'd spent then two years trying to communicate with the team and provide my written statements from the British service members. Jock, um, Jocko's I asked, team, you mean? Yep, yep, yep. I was sending everything. But here's what's really beautiful and amazing is because of all of this, I've been able to reconnect with so many of the Brits that I served with. Even Commander, uh, I can't say, I almost just said his name, <laughs> Commander <laughs> Blot, um, who was the, he's the commander of, of uh, uh, the, I think he's in the 3rd Scott Battalion right now still. But um and we've reconnected and he's trying to get permission right now to, to help me with my film. And then I've got uh, my platoon sergeant that was there who's actually been, uh, he all these guys put quotes in my book. Um, and so I got this really amazing opportunity to reconnect with Hoppo's wife um, who has since passed and, you know, some people. And so it's, you know, again, these things are happening for you, not to you. And so yeah. at the time for the two years of hell, it put me through and, People can say, well, that was just my own weakness. But when you are 
directly in contact with somebody that can fix the situation and chooses not to, that's when it got really hard for me. And so what I realized at that moment was that nobody deserves a pedestal, that we're all humans going through a human experience and that we all make mistakes, but it doesn't mean that you can't forgive people. It All it means is that you don't have to forget. Because ultimately, when you don't forgive someone and you hang on to that anger, it's that old saying of like, I'm swallowing the poison, hoping that it will kill you. And it's just harming me. It's just hurting me. And so I had to sit down and I actually was struggling with it so bad that I I called Heroic Hearts Project and I said, guys, I just, I think I need to go sit with some medicine and really work through some things. And as soon as I called, they said, okay. And I got, I, I went to Peru and I got to work through it. And what it ultimately came down to was I was putting people on a pedestal looking for, I was looking for others to give me approval of who I already was and who I already am and who, what I've already done. And I don't need anyone's approval. I just need my own. And the problem was I wasn't giving myself the self-love, the self-approval, the self-worth, self-acceptance, that radical self-acceptance and love. And so as soon as I started doing that, I could then, you know, after I prompted and say, hey, this book's coming out, I wrote about you in it. So that's ultimately when they invited me back on the show. And so that's the interview that's currently out. That's why I was, she was spicy at the beginning. Um, yeah because we hadn't spoken two years. And the last time I spoke is it, he said it would go back up. And then I was in the studio and he pulled out an envelope that I didn't see and just started reading the statement that I had no idea. And I went from in my body and ready and present to saying everything that had been on my mind for two years. <laughs> and that was how you got the first 12 minutes of that episode. It was great to, to hear from you. I was so impressed. Uh, for a bunch of different reasons. But again, and now that you said, I didn't know that he was reading from a statement that makes it worse for, for me, but only for my opinion. Um, I just think he needed to work out his thoughts. And I think sometimes yeah. in those environments, I think him looking down and kind of going through it was probably the best way for a public figure to do so. Yeah, I agree there. But the apology is, is, is if I do something wrong, no, I, I Steve Henson, the All Blacks rugby coach, now taught me this, um, you know, self-reflection um, and, um, you know, uh, owning those those mistakes. You've got to do that and, and, and improve. But I really enjoyed listening to you on that. Uh, it was my first uh, foray into it. That's kind of what I love about Andy. Andy just doesn't know anything about any, anybody else. And he was saying, when he went on Joe Rogan, he's like, I don't know this guy's show. It's just Joe Rogan. It's just yeah. a guy I'm speaking to. Um, and he's just so um, authentic. Uh, there so thank you for uh covering that and um mm -hmm. and, and speaking to your way out of that which is beautiful because i was so concerned it's like well hang on a sec she's done all this work and this is a, a terrible thing that i see happening in front of me that's moral injury literally right there it was a perfect mm -hmm. definition of moral injury um uh for, for people to to understand um i think yeah. though too hun that if you if you allow others to dictate how you feel about yourself, you're always going to be let down. And I had to go through that experience, whether as negative as it looked, to grow into who I'm able to be and who what I'm able to see in people's behaviors. And I'm I'm able to acknowledge why people what they do uh, do what they do a little bit differently. And so I I've I've been able to forgive him because I've been able to forgive myself. And once you do that, it's all okay. You just realize like it's, he's just, that's the thing people forget, right? Is um, when they look at people like you and I who are doing podcasts and we're putting ourselves out there and being vulnerable and like opening ourselves up to, well, that's what you get when you open yourself up. It's like, okay, I get it. But ultimately what you got to realize is like, we're just people who were kids, who did stuff, who just based on time alone are now adults. and we all, like he said, I know he didn't say I'm sorry and I, I, I would have loved and I'm sorry, but I also know I got more than most people will ever get out of him in terms <laughs> of I fucked up. Um, so for me, it's like once you realize that genuinely we all just 
make decisions and sometimes they're not the right ones, even if you're a celebrity or not, once you just realize that and you can put yourself in them, them shoes and like truly in their shoes, then you can go like, yeah, I would have freaked out too. Like, yeah, I, I probably could handle that better, but like, Hey, it's a learning opportunity. And I just see it as that. So it's like, I get it. He made a mistake. And, um, I think he'll never make that one again. And I know I won't make that again because I also now protect my story a little bit. And I'm also yeah. just, I'm just not as forgiving in, in some of those things, but you can forgive people, man. You have to. Yeah. Gosh. Um, it's, it's part of some of that stuff that I talked about with John Keogh, same thing, uh, you know, um, what you're projecting, you're also internalizing um, that law of attraction. But what you said there, Kelsey, um, about um, uh, in the middle there, kind of a, uh, you're touching on identity and so on, it just reminded me of, of Del Alexander, same thing. Mm -hmm. People that aren't, um, uh, you see, if you can't imagine having your swipe card cancelled then and there, literally, push you out of the gate of the, the compound and that's what he had done to him and um yeah and you and I, you and him just seem to resonate so much um of well that's their thing I'm me you know look where you are now look at where he has gone with his uh his career his country music it's mm -hmm. well it's it's moving on but seem to be in a really good headspace so yeah again it's a, it's a full circle back to how we started the show uh, introduction from Dallas well, you also are the sum of the people you surround yourself with. And I will say that I'm really fortunate that I'm really, really good friends with Dallas. And Dallas is a person that I talk to about these things because we both have been in the same positions in the sense that we served. Trust mm. me, I'm not comparing myself to the world's greatest sniper. Trust the six foot five country singing with like the hottest wife in all the land. I'm not <laughs> comparing myself to him, although my husband is pretty hot. I am saying though that he is somebody that I found uh, a really good friend in, in the sense that a confidant where we've had a similar lifestyle. We both have spouses. We both have children. We both are trying to do something extraordinary and mm. put ourselves out into the fire and we're both speaking broadly about topics that are uncomfortable for others so when something pops off i know i can pick up the phone and be like yo i don't fucking know who to talk to about this and i don't know how to feel about it like do you have any advice because my husband will go like that's all cool but when i was a professional supercross racer people just signed up to sleep with me they didn't argue with me they didn't they wanted my signature and they wanted to like do stuff yeah. The professional athletes get a different thing. And he's like, so I can't, I don't know how to help you in that. And then I go to my girlfriends and they're like, yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I work a nine to five or <laughs> I, I am having kid issues. And I'm like, I need to talk to somebody who's trying to be this massive public figure. Who's trying to make change. Who's putting their feet in the fire, who's showing up in a different way. And this dude's like, yo, homie, what's up? And yeah. so I'm I'm grateful for his friendship and his family's friendship more importantly because they are such an incredible package deal and um when you get him you get Sarah when you get Sarah you get Gigi and you get little man you get this awesome community so you are the sum of the people you surround yourself with I'm able to be better because the people I surround myself with are literally the best killers in the world in mental health in physical health in their family units and what matters. And I really curate my my people because I know that if I wanna be this person in this world, I need to have a solid base around me that are not yes men, that are people that are gonna say, Kelsey, you fucked up and go, oh, how do I fix this? And then they'll help me fix it, not watch me burn. It's very clever, creating, not reacting, but creating your, I was going to say friends, but that's incorrect. Creating the people you surround yourself with, which is what you yeah. said. That's very, very clever. I like that a lot. A again, it brings me back to um, the All Blacks rugby um, uh, mentality, uh, the book Legacy, and DJ Shipley spoke to that with, with SEAL Team 6, how they, they really instilled that, took some of that, um, uh, uh, the mindset and and some of those um some of the way they they did things you know you deserve to be here you're coming on the team you deserve to be here but here are our expectations and surrounding the team around that new person with the expectations and 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 looking at your practices and and actually doing what you say you're going to do and, and reflecting uh what i loved that about radical Steve. accountability exactly that, that's so that's actually the next that, that part i was going to bring up um 
Steve Hansen is famous for um, being relatively stoic. His, his face is like not too excited, not too underexcited. And I asked him why. And he said, well, if, if, the, if something happens on the field and the team looks up and I'm kicking off in the coach's box, will that help them or will it hurt them? Will this help? And, and that's how I'm basing a lot of decisions for myself. Is this going to help the situation with my, with my child or is it going to hurt it? And, and that's that radical accountability. That's is, all these different ways of saying the same thing that so many people right. on this show say, say. I said I'd speak to you about the book and the lectures because that's probably where this is is summarizing up. Um, I didn't know you had the book until um, I, I heard you on on Jocko and I saw it uh, there on on, uh, on Cleared Hot. Talk to us about the book and 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 also what you lecture on, please. Yeah, yeah. So the the book came out in July last year. Uh, it was really exciting, July eleventh, and we. I'm one of currently, I believe, like a hand, maybe a handful of female veterans that have books. Um, I'm proud of that because there's only so few of us, and I think it's important to take risks. And I believe it's important to put yourself out there because John Bernenthal asked me when I did the real ones. He's like, "What books did you read when you got out to help you?" And I went, "There were none." So <laughs> exactly. I said, you know, I mean, you could have, I could have, I guess it doesn't have to be sex based, but I could have listened to Goggins or I could have listened to someone else, but I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, you know, when I got out, none of those books existed in 2011. I'm yeah. pretty sure if I'm not, I'm pretty sure. But my point in saying that it was, I wanted to illustrate how somebody can heal using journaling. I wanted to illustrate how somebody can heal when you put page, you know, pen to paper. Um, I'm a big believer. You can't like my, my friend, John, um, my friend, Dr. Uh, John Deloney says like, you got to take the bricks out of the backpack. You can't carry them around. They're not yours to carry anymore. And so that was a form of taking the bricks out of the backpack. And I wrote, I wrote this book and uh, I finished it before we even brought it to a publisher. Originally it was with a Canadian publisher. COVID happened. I pulled it from them. And then I was introduced to um, people at Inkwell and they repped it for me. They sent it out. And then we got a publishing deal with Post Hill and it distributes through Simon and Schuster. So we did the deal with them. I signed the paper a couple of days before I actually went to Peru. And on my way back from Peru, I wrote the last three chapters of the book on the plane. Wow. And then I submitted, I submitted it in August and it came out the following July. It was a, you know, I started writing that book. Oh my gosh. Back when I was 29, I remember sitting for my 30th birthday, I went to Las Vegas because I don't like to party, but I like good food and I like sun and I like tattoos. So I went, we had good food. We laid by the pool. I wrote my book and we went and got tattoos. And so we did that for my 30th and I, you know, I finished it up. Um, I had it 99% of the way when I was 30 and then I'm going to be 35 this year. So it was a, a process for sure to get it out there. Um, not a lot of people wanted to take a, a risk on a female veteran book. <laughs> not ideal for most publishers. They kind of <laughs> want like, a, you know, a Marcus Luttrell or a, like a Kennedy or, you know, something with an American flag and a vest on. Like I, that wasn't going to be my deal. So I wrote the book. I wrote the 70,000 uh, page uh, words and um, I had a lot of help with editors getting it to where it was. And I was really fortunate for all the people that were willing to put time into it. And then when it came time for me to reach out to my community, I was able to, you know, reach out to people like Andy Stump and Matthew Griffin for combat flip-flops and Jesse Gould from Heroic Hearts and Nikki Gay with Purple Hearts and just like Alana and Dean Stott. Like, oh, of course, Alana and Dean. Great, great kids. Yeah. D, um, so Ears is one of my good friends and Alana, <laughs> I would kill anyone for. Yeah. So Alana, actually, they're both in my book, not only in quotes, but they're both in my book because they were the reason I was able to uh, evac that family that we got from Canada, the VIPs. So if you haven't read the book, we were, this book talks about, it's a memoir. So it talks about my fighting life, talks about my military service, talks about the fallout of my military service all the way back into my healing. We covered the 2021 pullout because I was involved. Um, in a small way, but enough of a way that we were able to pull the VIP family of the Afghan government back to Canada and get them through unconventional, very unconventional means. <laughs> and I was able to do it because Alana, when I called her and I said, hey, I need your help. Two seconds later, she goes, what do you need? So yep. um, this family's currently living. Half of them are in New York. Half of them are in Canada. Um, one has a guest lecture spot at Ottawa University. The other ones are thriving and have now just had their first 
baby born in America. And I got to meet with this family when I was on my book tour, which was amazing. And yet, and his wife, Walwala, put quotes in my book as well. And so we actually transcribe because I'm a psychopath in that I only <laughs> send voice messages most of the time. And so in this book, I, I'll see if I can pull it up. But in this book, what I did, because we use Signal, is I transcribed all the voice messages. So right. you're getting word for word um, and screenshots. I'll show you here. Oh, beautiful. Yep. And you're getting screenshots and the photos of the actual movement uh, that we did over the seven day period to ultimately get them on one of the last flights out. So this book covers that. It covers my psychedelic, uh, my first psychedelic journeys and how I got to where I am now. And it ends in 20, the end of 2021. So now I'm, you know, we've got, we're in 24, probably should start writing again you know, work on another one, but I'm just, I'm stoked because it's been optioned and we're, we're in that process now of, you know, the script writing and all of the fun bits that come along. And hopefully if we can finally get that thing to the green light, it's, it's going to be a, a different war book, that, a movie that you've never seen before. So maybe I'm this excited. one will be true. <laughs> Oh, she's spicy over here today. I if you, like it. If you it. know, you know. Oh, I like if it. you know, you know. Barry Woo! Rice, Barry Rice, New Zealand SAS guy, was on this show and he was brilliant. Um, and uh, he w helped, uh, he was a military uh, advisor on Zero Dark Thirty. Yes. He, he starred in Zero Dark Thirty alongside another one of the uh, NZSS lads. I asked him, who really killed Osama bin Laden? His oh, answer, yeah, that's... His answer blew my mind. He doesn't even Look think at me. It... I just had this conversation with another friend of mine who actually is about, who is co-hosting with him. <laughs> and they're going to release and tell the story publicly. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> I yeah. love that you're yeah. going to have a, a, a true story, Kelsey. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's going to be true. It's going to have a lot of Brits involved. It's going to have a lot of Americans involved. It's going to have my sergeants involved. It's going to have my staff involved. It's going to have the Rangers involved. It's going to have everybody involved that was involved because I believe those people deserve their names to be known and no one will ever tell me I cannot say their names ever again. <laughs> oh, I think we have to have to finish it there. It's just, <laughs> I, <laughs> I get lots of words. Yeah, you know, talking to Todd yesterday, what's the angle of the show? And uh, and boom, here we are. You fucking nailed it. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Anytime. We got to have you on mine whenever you're ready. I would love to. I would be absolutely honored. Um, as I said at the start, everybody's heard the narrated show notes. All the links are in, the sh in there as well. But people listening to this point, where do they find you? Where do they find Brass Unity, Unity um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and the book? Yeah, absolutely. I'm doing a lot of things. Uh, I travel a ton, meaning uh, I'm a speaker. So if you guys want to hire me for an event, I fly everywhere. It is fun. I love it. I'd love to come to New Zealand. Somebody hire me from New Zealand. I would love to come to New Zealand. You have no idea how badly. Um, I am a coach. I work with clients all over the world. Also, people in New Zealand, what up? Let's go. I would love to work with some of you. I have served with uh, the Fijians. I have served with all these amazing cultures, and New Zealand is on my list um, to work with. So if you want to, if you want to work with me as a client, I only take a few clients a year. I'm not a cheap human. I am a very in-depth, hardworking client, uh, coach relationship. I travel with people as well. And, um, so you can get me out there at KelseySharon.com. You can book coaching, you can book speaking. I have a retreat coming up. Not sure when this is airing, but I have a retreat coming up that you can come to in May. It is a four month container, meaning it involves integration and it involves preparation. And then you come to Cortez Island for four days. And we do breath work and we do medicine and we are in a secluded area and it is absolutely incredible. We only have 14 spots and we just dropped this retreat. So it's going to go quickly. Um, I am also the CEO of Brass and Unity Jewelry, which means we make products out of these guys here, old bullet casings, 
And we donate 20% of the net proceeds to organizations all over the world that work with veterans and first responders. That is what I started with. I also have a podcast called The Brass and Unity Podcast, where we talk to amazing human beings. We talk about extraordinary live stories and basically the lessons and tools very similar to what you do just with a female host. And so that's what we've got going on. You can check everything else at brassandunity.com. You guys can go and grab a copy of a signed copy of Brass and Unity. It comes with a buddy check pack which is our, our packs that are a suicide prevention tool. They come as a pack of two. You buy a buddy, you call, uh, you buy a pack, you call a buddy, you save a life. Don't have a beer, go for a walk, give them a bracelet, let them know they've got your six when you're around. You'd be shocked how much these bracelets work. We've seen it. We've been told people have stayed with us because it was just enough of a reminder before they grab the gun on their wrist to know that somebody else would be very upset if that happens. So Brassandunity.com, all jewelry, all books, Brass and Unity podcasts. We're on every platform you can imagine, including Patreon, mental health group on Signal. We have that. You go through Patreon to get there. And then if you want to coach with me, speak with me, or do any of my breath work, which we do virtually too. I am a somatic breath work practitioner and I do retreats. You can do all of that at KelseySharon.com. Wow. I just got goosebumps for the second time there. First time was when we were talking about the haka. Um, and uh, gosh. I'm, I'm just lost for words. You, it's been amazing and well worth the wait, uh, Giddy on Kelsey. Thank, Thank you for being so open. Thank you for what you do. And um, and I said this to Major General Greg Martin last week. Again, congratulations to you for where you are at. You know, we started the show off with what's your purpose, and uh, and and you live and breathe that, and you you show that in your words, your body language, all those things. So. I, I say that sincerely. Congratulations on what you've accomplished and what you're doing to help others as well. Thank you. I'm just going to take a second. I receive that. Normally, that is something I would brush off, but I'm working really hard to receive compliments. So I received that and I am very grateful for that. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you for dealing with all of the ups and downs of the time zones on the other side of the world. <laughs> Hopefully one day we can meet in person. Hey, you never know. Maybe after this, some famous client of yours will show up and fly me to New Zealand and we can do it in person, my friend. That sounds great. Thank you so much for coming on. I'll hit pause. I'll have a chat. Great to see you. Amazing. Hi, thanks for watching. I'm Damien Porter, former Special Forces Operator. And check out my new project for 2023 at hownottodie.com.au where I've combined all my special forces training and police officer experience to help others. Thanks for watching.